Thank you so much for joining us. We know this word will significantly impact your life, so let's tune in. Oh, somebody loves the Lord, open your mouth and give God your best praise right here. Come on, I want you to raise this roof if you love Jesus on tonight. Come on, somebody to wave your hands in the air. Wave them like you just don't care. Let that devil know I came to give God my best praise. Open your mouth and holler at your boy. Now, just in case, just in case you're sitting next to somebody and they don't know what's about to happen to them, I want you to just tell them in advance. Why don't you turn to them and shake them by the hand and tell them, neighbor, I don't know about you, but God's been too good to me for me to be quiet about it. So you're going to have to excuse me for just a few moments while I give God my best praise. Now go ahead and give it to him. If you feel like leaping, you need to leap. If you feel like running, you need to run. If you feel like clapping, you need to clap. You need some room, push on somebody and say, give me some room. But you got to let me take the next 30 seconds and give God a praise. He's been too good to me for me to be quiet about it. Open your mouth right here. How many people came to raise the roof and give God praise on tonight? Amen. I am so glad to be in San Bernardino at the Way World Outreach. This is my second home. Amen. Hey, San Bernardino. <laughs> Amen. Give it up for the man of God, the angel of his house, Pastor Marco Garcia. And his lovely wife, Lisa. Come on, y'all can do it. Amen. Give it up for Pastor Roberts and all the pastors, the associate pastors here, the leadership, the volunteers. Come on, give a real big hand to all of the workers, the supporters, the, the laborers, the volunteers, the group leaders, the home group leaders, everybody in the house, these musicians, this incredible band. Amen. Yo, act like y'all came to have church on tonight. Uh, how many people came to have church on tonight? We are so glad to be, please be seated, please be seated. We're so glad to make our journey here to the house of God and to deliver. <laughs> I love you too. Amen. We're so glad to be here to deliver God's word to you on tonight. It has always been my desire to be the kind of person who, who hears from God. To not just pick up my Bible and take a text and to just find something that I feel will uh, entertain you. Uh, if you want entertainment, you can go to the movies for that. You can go to a concert for entertainment. But my desire is to have my ear to God's mouth and to be in a place where I am sensitive to what God wants to say to his people. And so in the few moments that I have, how many of you been enjoying this impartation? I mean, I always enjoy coming to you during this, this period of impartation. And, and I know you look to me to impart something to you, but I always get something from you that you impart to me. So this is a relationship we got going on, amen? And this relationship has been going on for what, about five, six, seven years now, Marco? Amen, amen. Amen. And I appreciate, I appreciate Pastor Marco being the kind of man of God who will hold me accountable. That, that whether my life is in a great place or not so great place, he's always been that consistent man of God who will speak the word and tell the truth. I think you ought to praise God one more time. God, Pastor Marco, God said he'll give you shepherds after, your own, after his own heart. Amen. And so out of my desire to impart something during this great event, the Lord spoke to me out of the 92nd Division of Psalms. And if you would turn there for me, the 92nd Division of Psalms. 
beginning at verse 12 down to verse 14. And I'm going to be reading to you out of the NIV translation, so it may sound just a little bit different from yours. Psalms 92, verse 12 through 14. I'm sorry. You got it? Did I give you the right one? When you, when you got it, say amen. amen. The word of the Lord reads this way. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. Even, even in old age, they will still bear fruit. Healthy and green, they will remain. And I want to drop back to the 13th verse because there's a word there that the Lord put in my spirit regarding you. It's one word in that sentence that I want you to attach your faith to on tonight. And I believe it's gonna help somebody. That, that one word I wanna use for a subject tonight is flourish. L look at somebody stand next to you and I'll say, and begin to prophesy over them, I command you to flourish. Because I hear the Spirit of God speaking over every area of your life, your finances, your relationships, your resources, I see God standing over your situation and he's commanding that place to flourish. Dead places are coming back. Unproductive places are coming back. God is speaking. I wish somebody would prophesy to somebody else and say, I command you. I command you. I command things that have been stopped up, that have been held up, that have been held back. I'm commanding it by the Spirit of God to flourish. Everybody that believes that God is speaking to you prophetically, give God a praise right here. Flourish. Father, bless your word on tonight. I, I, I step out of the way and ask you to have your way, that you would permeate this place with your anointing, that God, you would give me the ability, the nimbleness of mind and the ability of speech to declare your word. And, and I pray for the anointing, God, because nobody came, Lord, to be impressed with my oratorical ability, but they came, Lord, to hear a word from you. Speak to us in every area of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look at somebody and say, flourish. To flourish simply means to bud, to blossom, and to sprout. And what I want you to picture is a plant or a garden that's in full bloom ripe fruit, strong branches, have, have lush green leaves. It's, it's beautiful. But it requires constant care if it's going to remain beautiful. All gardens need to be maintained and cultivated if they're going to remain in its ideal condition. So let me hasten to say this. Everything in your life requires maintenance in order to operate at its fullest potential. And maintenance is simply consistent, regular care of something. Consistent, regular care of something. I Meaning if it's gonna to continue to be productive, if it's gonna to continue to be effective, it's not just about getting it. It's about maintaining it. Some of you Bible scholars will remember that in the Garden of Eden, the first job that God gave to Adam was to keep the garden. His job was to, uh, to tend it and to keep it. That, and what that suggests to me is that even in a perfect paradise situation, that if you don't maintain what God has given to you, it can turn into a wilderness. Uh, I'm going to say a couple things tonight, so you might as well hold on to your seatbelts. 
that, that, that it's not just enough for God to put things into your hands if you're not going to keep it. And I find this out about people that a lot of people are passionate about gaining stuff, but they're not as passionate about keeping stuff. And what good is it for God to give you something if you're not going to be able to keep it? And so we are eagerly running into God's presence saying, God, give me things. Give me prosperity. Give me resources. Give me opportunity. And so God gives those things into your hands. And then once he puts it in your hands, he expects you to maintain it and to keep it. Oh, let me take my time right here. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that many of the things that we label as acts of the devil are simply neglect. <laughs> that we call ourselves rebuking the devil off of our money and off of our relationships but but quite honestly it's just uh, we have neglected to give things attention that require our constant attention and when we neglect things that require our attention we reap the negative consequences and we call it the devil Oh, let me prove it to you. Let me prove it. You can have a nice car, brand new, shiny, nice wheels and everything, but if you don't take it in for what they call those regular maintenance schedules, you know, if, if you don't keep the oil changed, if you don't keep the tires rotated, if you don't keep the tune-ups up you're supposed to, your car can be sitting on the side of the road. You say the devil took my car, but in reality, you just didn't pay attention to the little red light. You kept on driving, even though the light was flashing at you, it was telling you, I need attention from you, and you ignored it and kept on speaking in tongues, and now you're sitting on the side of the road. Because of neglect. Oh, let me go here. Let me, some, some, <laughs> some of you, some of you, you, when it comes to your relationships, your relationships are suffering from your neglect. Because relationships of any kind breathe the air of your attention. And they're watered by the consistency of your presence. And if you consistently neglect or disconnect or disappear from your relationships, you will soon lose the things that God has given to you. Oh. Uh, you say the devil took my girl or took my man, but I submit to you, they didn't take anything. It's just that somebody decided to be consistent where you were inconsistent, and now you call it the devil. Come on, ladies, back me up on this. You know you started out doing, you know how men are. At first, we pursue you, right? It's candy and cards and flowers and phone calls, but after you get them, you don't pay no attention to them, and you, oh, I'm sorry. This ain't the marriage seminar. Y'all got to call me back when I, for the marriage seminar. We're, we'll share some stuff with you that I learned after 24 years of marriage that might be able to help you. But, but I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that you can't rebuke the devil over things that you have been inconsistent about. Same is true with your soul. That your soul requires care and concern if it's going to be productive and going to be fruitful. We don't participate in what I call soul care. And soul care to me is more than just a spa day or a vacation day or even a mental health day. It's the things that we regularly do to nourish our souls. What sort of things do you participate in that nourish your soul? Jesus said this, what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? That, that what happens is there's always the danger in us acquiring things at the expense of our soul. And what we do many times is we fill our lives with things and begin to neglect the most important thing. Here's what the Bible says, 3 John verse 1 and 2. He said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health as your soul prospers. That your soul, your life, your life should prosper in proportion to your soul. 
And what happens is the spiritual life is the substratum of everything in your life. The your spiritual life is the most important thing. And what the apostle was saying is, I want your soul to prosper as your, I want your life to prosper as your soul prospers, meaning that as you, if you neglect your soul prosperity, then what happens is it begins to affect everything else. And many people are running after stuff at the expense of their spirituality. And then your life is out of balance because God did not want you to be a slave to things that there should be something in you that as you begin to uh, prosper spiritually, that it begins to affect your finances and your relationships and all the things that God has for you. Look at somebody and say, my soul is prospering. That's why we come to church. We come to church because we're trying to get our souls fed. We're trying to get our spirit man developed. And as God begins to bless my spirit man, it begins to affect everything else in my life because my spiritual life is the substratum, the foundation of everything that I have. What good does it, does it do to have a grand house and have an empty soul? What good does it do to have a large bank account but losing in my spirituality? What good does it do to gain everything here and lose heaven? And yet there are people who every day wake up trying to pursue things because we think things will make us happy. We pursue things thinking that the more things I can get, the happier I can be. And there are people right now who have plenty of things, but their soul is parched. That's why we come running up in here on a Sunday morning or throughout the week, because I recognize that what I need for my life to be prosperous and truly happy is not more stuff. I need more God. How many people need more God in here? How, how many people in here don't mind testifying and knowing that you can have everything in the world, but if you don't have Jesus, you don't have nothing? Take the whole world, but give me Jesus. Everybody here that wants Jesus, open your mouth and give him your best praise right in here. If my spiritual life fails, eventually it begins to affect everything else. And because it is God's will that every part of your life be productive, God is often pictured metaphorically as a gardener, what the Bible calls a husbandman. In John 15 and 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman or the gardener. And so I don't want you to picture yourself being a plant of the Lord that God just sits in a corner and allows it to be neglected and not pay attention to. But a gardener was somebody who was constantly working, constantly cultivating a plant. Because here's the thing, a gardener expects the garden to produce fruit that is equal to the amount of effort he has invested in it. That as a gardener begins to work the ground and to cultivate the ground and begin to uh, give maintenance and give attention to the plant that he has planted, it is a frustration to the gardener to put so much effort into you with so little return. This is why I don't understand people that don't give God praise. I believe that God sometimes is standing over your life saying, for as much as I've done for you, you can't give me no better praise than that. For, for as much as I've done in your life, for, let, me, let me give you a list. For the things I brought you out of, for the things I delivered you from, for the things that coulda, woulda, shoulda happened to you, for the plots of the devil that didn't work, for the arrows I stopped at night, for the devils I shut down, for the chains I broke off of you, you can't give me no more praise than that. You mean for the times I got them drugs out of your system? For the relationships I broke you out of? For the times you almost lost your mind? You can't give me no better praise than that? I'm looking at you wondering what's wrong with you? Look at somebody say, I owe God a praise right here. 
I know I might get on your nerves and I might be loud and I might be rowdy and I might sweat, but when I begin to think about what God has brought me out of, ain't no way in the world I'm going to sit up in this place and fold my legs and look around like I'm crazy. Somebody that knows God brought you out of something and you're not ashamed of it, I dare to give God a praise. I want God to know. Ain't nothing worse than an ungrateful spirit. Ain't nothing worse for doing something for somebody and they don't have enough nerve to say thank you. But God said, when I stand over your life and I begin to do things for you, I don't do it for my health. I want to return out of you. I God is an investor. He doesn't do anything that you don't expect to return on. Is there anybody that's got a prayer life that's a return? Oh, I don't blame you. Somebody just thought about the goodness of God. Somebody just thought back about five years ago. You wouldn't have even been here. You would have been sitting in somebody's jail or sitting around on crack or walking somebody's street corner. But because of the grace of God, I'm still... I wish you would sit there and act like you don't know who I'm talking about. Just in case somebody next to you don't understand who you're talking about, slap somebody and say his name is Jesus. It's not Muhammad. It's not Confucius. It's not Buddha. I want the devil to know his name is Jesus. Somebody that knows his name is Jesus, open your mouth and call his name. All right, all right, relax. I ain't, I ain't there yet. <laughs> so three things. Picture, so picture God in his garden, constantly active. Don't picture God being passive, being a passive uh, passenger in your life who just plants you in a corner somewhere and walks away, but God is intimately and intricately involved in every area of your life. So, so picture a garden who's constantly working, constantly busy, constantly inspecting. He's a fruit inspector, constantly trying to see what kind of fruit is coming out of your life. Constantly bringing in stuff that's gonna help you grow. And so the first thing I wanna talk to you about is he sets you. The Bible says that those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. That word plant there is properly translated transplant. And what God does is he moves you from one place to another place because he wants you to get proper nourishment. And when God sees that the place that you're in is no longer nourishing you like it should, God takes the aggressive position and begins to move you from where you were to where you need to be. Some of you, you wonder why God is moving you away from certain people and certain situations because I don't get my nourishment from there anymore. There was a time it gave me nourishment, it gave me strength, but God said the place that you were getting nourishment from before, it doesn't have what you need anymore. So I got to put you in a better place. I got to put you around some more productive people. I got to put you in some more positive situations. You're still trying to get life out of a dead thing. And God said, I got to move you to a place that you get more nourishment from. The only thing wrong with some of us is we're still, we've outgrown people. And you're still trying to get nourishment from places that God said is no longer productive for you. And I'm trying to get you to be a green, luscious, fruit-bearing tree, but you're still hanging out in places that don't feed you anymore. Is there anybody know that like to be sitting in a place that don't feed you anymore? It doesn't nourish you anymore. Have you ever been around people that used to encourage you, but now they drain you? 
and it's not that I don't love you and it's not that I don't like you but I can't sit around and gossip with you anymore because my soul needs to be fed by somebody that's inspiring to me and I can't get nourishment from you talking about what so and so had on and what so and so wore I got to get about some people that are talking about how to get my soul strong how to get my spirit fed how to get my money together how to keep my relationship strong look at somebody say I'm out growing give me some room The problem with some of you is you need more space. Your roots need more space to spread out. And so what God does is God will uproot you. He will take you out of one environment because that environment is no longer conducive for what I'm trying to produce in your life. And here is the uncomfortable place because once God disconnects you from something, there's that uncomfortable space between where you were and where you're trying to be, that uncomfortable place between your destiny and your history where you're not quite sure what's going to happen. And that's when faith has to take over because any time God takes you out of something, he plans to take you into something. God never brings you out of something. If he doesn't plan to take you all the way in, God is not a halfway God. If God brought you out, he's going to take you all the way in. How many folks are glad God's going to take you all the way? God is not a halfway God. He which has begun a great work in you shall perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. That any time God brings you out of something, he brings you out with the full attention of bringing you into something. That's why he takes you out of poverty into prosperity. He takes you out of sickness into healing. And on your way to your promise, there's a devil standing there saying you're not going to make it. But that devil is a liar. God has promised me he's going to take me all the way in. If you're glad God's going to take you all the way in. Give God 30 seconds of praise right here. I said give God 30 seconds of praise if you know I'm going all the way in. I come to tell somebody that your fight is over your destiny. That that devil is afraid you're going to fool around and step into what he's called you to be. He's trying to do everything he can to keep you away from what God has promised to you. But snap about three people that say, I'm going all the way in. I'm going to fight my way in. I'm going to dance my way in. I'm going to pray my way in. I'm going to praise my way in. But I'm going. And let me just warn you, when you make up your mind that you're going to go after your destiny, you're going to have some folks mad at you. They're going to say you're being funny and you're being deep and it don't take all that. But the problem is that when God called us, called you to something, you got to leave some people behind. You got to leave some people standing there with their mouth open. You got to let the haters hate and let the talkers talk. If you're going to hate on me, you're going to look, talk to my back because I'm moving toward my destiny. Somebody start walking with me. That's planning on moving to your destiny. I want some crazy people to start walking with me. Where are you going? I'm going to my destiny. I'm going to my wealthy place. I'm going to my miracle. Excuse me. Get out of my way. Have you ever noticed that as long as you stay low, as long as you stay with low thinking people, as long as you stay with people that's not going anywhere, as long as you don't fool around and try to be something, that folks love you and they don't mind you hanging around. But the moment you decide you want something better for your life, then all of a sudden your choices, friend, become your enemies. And they start talking about you like you done changed. But look at somebody say, I'm supposed to change. I'm supposed to change from a caterpillar into a butterfly. I'm supposed to move into the next dimension. I'm not supposed to be the same place I was last year. I'm supposed to be in a different place. Look at somebody say, I'm in a different place now. I'm in a different place. I know I just came through 2019, but this is 2020. I'm going to be a new man. I'm going to be a new woman. I'm going to be a new preacher. I'm going to be a new woman. Where are my people that plan on being something new? Yeah! 
You should have took your 2019 selfies last year because this is a new year. This is 2020. This is the year of double double. Everybody's expecting double double this year. Jump up on your feet and say, I expect it. I expect it. I expect it. Next thing. Next thing. God, God takes the aggressive position of moving you because he knows how we are. And sometimes if he expected you to do it, you wouldn't do it. Because we get comfortable in a place and we want to stay there. And God begins to disrupt your life. And you wonder why certain things are being taken away from you or it disconnects you from certain things. It's because God is more concerned about your development than he is with your comfort. God is more committed to your growth than he is to your comfort. And so even when you don't have the mind to, God will begin to shake up some things. And he transplants you. And he puts you in a place that you can get new nourishment. And some of you that work in the garden, you know what I'm saying. When he puts you in a place that has more nourishment, he puts you in a place with some, um, what's the nice word? Uh, fertilizer. Yeah, some compost. Some smelly stuff. Some stinky stuff. Somebody's trying to run away from your blessing because you done ran into some stinky stuff. And God said, I put the stinky stuff in there. I designed it for you to be in there because I knew you couldn't grow without some stinky stuff. Some folks here right now are going through some stinky situation. Don't smell good in here. God said, don't smell good to you, but it's going to be good for you because what you need is in the mess. Second thing, second thing, second thing, I gotta go. He says, the, the second thing God does is he showers you. He waters you. Now I'm gonna say this to you just because of the woman of transparency. Some people, like myself, they prefer like artificial plants. <laughs> because artificial plants require no work. They just stay beautiful all the time. They stay green all the time. They look luscious all the time. They require no work, but they also produce no life. And some people are so impressed with trying to look blessed rather than actually be blessed. We want to be clouds without water we want to have a form of godliness, but no power thereof. And God said, I'm tired of people putting on a front and acting like you got power, but you really don't have power. I had a, I had, I had a real plant, a real plant once, Pastor. I, I had artificial plants in my house because they're, they're low maintenance. You ain't got to do nothing. You just put them in the corner and they just stand there looking good. No work, no effort. No nothing. But I decided I wanted to get uh, uh, some real plants. And, and when I put real plants in my house, the only problem is real plants require attention. So I put the plant in there and just left it for like three days. When I first bought it, it was a big, pretty plant. I mean, bushy and green and it was lovely and everything and added something to my place. And I neglected it for like three days. No water. No attention, no pruning. I don't even talk to it. I just walk on past it. I know some of y'all got plants. Y'all actually talk to your plants and stuff like that when you water them. Yeah, she's smiling at me, yeah. Plants leak love. But I didn't do that. I left it for like three days. But when I, so when I came back to my plant, this one plant that was once flourishing and bushy and green and luscious was wilted and brown and dying. 
and it just looked bad. It looked bad, Pastor. And I was getting ready to throw the whole thing out, and I called one of my friends. I said, see, this is why I don't fool with real plants, because this just looks a mess. And I was getting ready to throw it in the trash can, and they said one thing to me that stopped the whole process. They just asked me, did you water it? Did I water it? Did you water it? Did you give any water to this plant? Well, I said, no. So I went, brother, and got some water, and I poured it into the plant, and I, I poured it until like, it was like really muddy and soppy, right? And I poured the water in there, and I walked away. And I don't mean, I mean, when I came back, I don't mean it was a whole day. I mean, I came back three hours later, and the plant that was bent over and brown and wilted had already started standing up. and green and started to look like it was coming back to life and I stood there looking at this plant that was, des that was destined for the dumpster was suddenly standing up and looking like it was about to be strong and the scripture came back to my mind in Job where he said there is hope for, even for a tree that if it's cut down that at the smell of water, it'll sprout back up again. And I come to tell somebody, God said, I'm standing over your life and I'm pouring the water of my spirit on it. Some of you done gave up on some stuff too soon. And God says some stuff that got away from you and some stuff you were about to throw away the trash, God said, I'm standing over it right now and I'm watering it with my word. Oh, you're not gonna get glad in here. Life is proof that the plant is getting water. And God said, I'm about to send some water to somebody's situation. Where are my people here that said lost some stuff last year? Some of you, God said, you're about to get your money back. You're about to get your healing back. You're about to get opportunities back. You're about to have doors open again. I feel the Spirit of God speaking over your life saying, flourish. Some of you give up too quick. Some of you are giving up too soon. I, you know what? I, I didn't know this, brother, until I went to West Virginia. I didn't know that you could smell rain. When I was a kid, I didn't notice I went to West Virginia because I, lived, I grew up in the city and I man, smell rain. What is that? I didn't know it was rain until it was raining. But I would be in one of the old mother's house and she would look out the window and sniff the air and say, it's getting ready to rain. And I wouldn't see a cloud in the sky. I wouldn't see a cloud in the sky. I didn't know that you could smell rain before it came. And sure enough, within a few hours, you laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Within a few hours, it would be a torrential downpour of rain. And I was saying, wow, how does that happen? And I didn't realize that when rain starts gathering, it changes the atmosphere. It changes the moisture level in the air. And you can smell the rain because the atmosphere begins to change, which means you can smell it even before you see it. I come to tell somebody that I smell rain. That somebody's life that's been wilting and coming down and look like it's going down. I come to just encourage you that I smell rain in the air and God said to tell you it's about to rain. Slap about three people say it's about to rain in here. This is why people of faith are weird. Because we see stuff before we see it. And we sense stuff before it's true because it's true in our spirit before it becomes true in our lives. And sometimes we're rejoicing over cars that we haven't even gotten yet. And we're happy about jobs that we haven't even been offered yet. And we're glad about relationships that we haven't even met yet. And we're excited about opportunities that haven't even knocked on the door yet. But because I smell, I smell, I 
I smell rain coming. Somebody lift your hands and say, I feel the rain coming. 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 I feel See, now this will bless this is what separates the saints from the ace. Because most people have to see something before they shout. I want to see the money in the account before I shout. I want to get the doctor's report before I shout. I want to get the house or the car before I shout. But people of faith are crazy. I said, people of faith are radical. I mean, they start acting like they got it before they even got it. Some of y'all got your praise backwards. You're saying, I'm going to wait till I get it before I praise him. But I'm going to praise him like I already got it. Like I already got a breakthrough. Like I already got my miracle. Like I already got my opportunity. Somebody praise him like you already got it. I know the devil laughing at you, but I already got it. I know your enemies are laughing at you, but I already got it. Clap your hands if you already got it. Laugh about three people say, I already got it. I already got it. I already got it. Don't pay attention to what you see right now. I already got it. Don't make the mistake of judging me based on where you met me. I already got it. Don't make the mistake of thinking this is all you're going to see. I already got it. Somebody give God 30 seconds of praise if you already got it. I already got it. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. Yeah, I already got it. See, some of y'all don't know what to do with this because you waiting to get the good news in the mail. But all the radical people who already got it, jump up on your feet because I already got it. Yeah, I already Well, let me qualify this next dance because I know how some of y'all are in church. I've been in church a long time. You at home practicing how you gonna praise him when God does it. You ain't got your two-step, you practice it in the mirror and say, when God does it, I'm gonna go to church and praise him like this. But I want some radical people to tell, to show up in here and look at somebody and say, this is how you praise him. When you know you already got it. This is how you praise him when you know you already got it. I'm not going to wait till he's doing. I'm going to praise him right now. Right now. Right now. I wish I had some radical hope. Right now. I'm going to praise him right here. Right now. somebody by the hand tell them neighbor I don't mean to get on your nerves but this is how you act when you know God's got you this is how you act when you already got it let me show you how you're supposed to dance when you're already when you're already when you're already when you're already Thought 
you wasn't going to dance till you came out of it. But I dare to dance your way out of it. I'm going to dance until the door opens. I'm going to praise him till the breakthrough comes. I'm going to shout until I see the rain. I feel. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Somebody that smelled the rain come and give God a shout. I mean, if you feel a blessing about to hit your house, give God a shout. Well, some of y'all don't understand why we shout, so let me, let me just explain just a minute why we shout. I didn't get to the last thing, because the last thing God does is he sustains you. God said to tell somebody, I know why you're nervously praising me because you're thinking that's what happened the last time. I got the job and I lost it. I got the marriage and I lost it. I got the opportunity and I lost it. But God said for this next season you're going into, everything I put in your hands, I'm going to sustain it. You're going to better hold on to it. You're going to better keep it. Oh, I got to get out of here. Let me tell you what's happening, Elder. The reason why a lot of people start losing what they got is because you don't understand that sometimes in a garden, you got two things that are sapping your strength. You got dead branches and you got parasites. Parasites rob you of your energy and dead branches rob you of your resources. But God said, I'm about to go through your life and I'm going to start taking off some dead branches and cutting off some parasites. Don't get mad if you see people start leaving your life because every branch in me that brings forth fruit, I purge it that it may bring forth more fruit. I'm about to have more fruit. Snap about three people and say, more fruit, more fruit, more fruit, more fruit. More fruit, more fruit, more fruit, more fruit. God said to tell somebody in here, for everything you lost, for every empty space in your life, for every void you've experienced, I'm about to put more fruit. You're going to have more fruit in that space. You're going to have more money in your pocket. You're going to have more opportunity. You're going to have more joy. You're going to have more peace. Somebody shout more.
message has been a blessing in your life and you would like to show support, please comment, like, share, and subscribe or click the link below so that you can contribute to our ministry. Thank you and God bless.